just a heads up for us. Um, we're on the record. We are now on the record. And um, the, the uh, clinics for the uninsured are not here today. So our agenda has been attenuated. And Jen Carby is going to be on the telephone because she was smart. <laughs> but Bryn is also smart. She's here. <laughs> Bryn is brilliant. I know, we know that. Okay. Just so you know. <laughs> so here we are. And you, uh, why don't you introduce yourself for the record and let us know what you have for us. Sure thing. So for the record, Bryn here from Legislative Council here with um, a draft 1.1 of a Senate Health and Welfare Committee amendment to H83. And I can talk to you about this amendment. I drafted it as a strike call. I could just as easily draft it as an instances of amendment if you prefer. There are four changes to this, um, and they're all essentially making the same change, which is changing female genital cutting to female genital mutilation or cutting. I understand that you heard some testimony yesterday from a clinician who indicated that, um, that um, in practice this is commonly referred to as female genital mutilation slash cutting. Um, I did a little research and see that the federal government um, in its documents on um, the World Health Organization and other websites refers to female, this practice as female genital mutilation or cutting. And when it's um, reduced to an acronym, it's FGM slash C. So our drafting operations office does not like to use a slash um, <laughs> for a few reasons, one of which is that it's awkward to read on the floor. So I've changed female genital cutting to female genital, genital mutilation or cutting in the chapter title on line eight in the section title, on line nine, on the, um, in subdivision B, prohibiting the practice, on line 16. And then the final change is at, on page three that we've retitled the bill to read an act relating to prohibiting female genital mutilation or cutting. So I added the word prohibiting there to make it a little bit more clear what the bill does. So um, again, this could easily be done as an instances of amendment if you'd prefer. Um, but I drafted it this way just for the sake of clarity to go through it with the committee. Um, I actually have a question, um, not about the changes that you've made, but going to the penalty section. Mm -hmm. Is that, uh, are those penalties consistent with other violations of medical practice or what? So um, violations of medical practice, I'm not sure. I'd have to look into what the- Not a medical practice violation. It's a- for a ch Like a- It's a, a crime. Penalty. Yes. So the House Judiciary Committee um, took possession of this bill um, when it was in the House and they reviewed the penalties to make sure that they were consistent with other sort of similar um, crimes. And um, so yes, I would say they are. I'm just looking through my notes to see what the penalty, I believe it was, it's consistent with the penalty for cruelty to a child. Oh, okay, child abuse. Yes. Yeah, we did hear that this was child abuse. Mm -hmm. oh. Not more than 20,000, I've got one in my committee that is a $25,000 fine no ifs, ands, or buts for failing to report a power outage to the 911 board. And how does someone know you haven't reported it? Well, it got I'm everyone's attention <laughs> as presented. I don't think it's going to leave the committee that way. But if I look at the severity between yeah. not reporting that you've got 25 people who can't read to cutting, I'm, I okay. think we're going to lower that. Yeah. So I haven't talked with Senator Sears about this one. I did talk with him about the other one, the uh, PA bill. And so, um, but I, I, I feel like we're ready to act on this bill. Get it yes. out of here. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and I know that, so, so I think whoever reports it, and I will uh, individually, and Bryn, maybe you could help us out in talking uh, with uh, judiciary about 
Yes. The penalties align precisely with the cruelty to a, the cruelty to a child statute. Also has mm -hmm. two s distinct um, penalties based on the severity of the of the crime, and that aligns one point one. precisely with the, the yeah. One point. But we they need to know here. they need to know that it's in here. Otherwise, we'll have a problem on the floor, and we don't want that to happen. So. Sure, I'd be glad to. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, so would you do you want to wait? Draft one point one. God, I can't do anything. No, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, we need a third. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. I had it ready to pull out. <laughs> it's easier than I thought. Okay. I move draft one point one of H eighty three. Second. Okay. Um, Senator Cummings. Yes. Senator Ingram votes yes. Senator McCormick. Yes. Senator Westman. Yes. Senator Lyons. Yes. Well done. <clears throat> and so we w who would like to report this? I'm going to do it. Okay. That would be good. Thank and you, Senator Westman. No. No. <laughs> I, I, I generally would take most anything, but I'd like to pass on this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll get you next time. Don't worry. Is mm -hmm. that considered the clean copy that we sent me? Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I'm not asking Senator McCormick. He's always doing his job. That's true. We're <laughs> doing another disturbing bill. <laughs> no, you're doing a good job. Senator Cummings, you're not interested in reporting this, or are you? I can, okay. but if Senator Ingram wants to do it, that's fine. We're good. Wait. Hello? Hello? Hello. Is that Jen Carby? It is. Uh, thank you for being on the telephone, Jen. Yeah, no problem. All right. So, and I know that you've got your daughter there, and you're not your your head is is there probably more than it is here. But we really appreciate the time you're taking. Um, yeah, no problem. All right, that's good. So there were two things that we are going to do. Um, the I think we'll keep in the order on the agenda. We're going to go through S two ninety probably in less detail than I had thought be, because we are um, remote. But then, um, and then go through S-288, and I understand we, ha and I told the committee that we had two suggestions from um, cannabis folks and then from others on definitions and so on. So we'll get to that second. Okay. All right, so why don't you just walk us through, everybody's here, by the way. We're, we're, all, we're all brave soldiers. I guess so, all right. <clears throat> All right, so we are looking at S-290, um, an act relating to health care reform implementation. And so I've broken it out with the, uh, what we call reader assistance headings, just to kind of orient you to wh where we are and what we're talking about. Um, so section one is the, uh, is the statute where the Green Mountain Care Board has oversight of accountable care organizations. And this would add a few elements uh, that statute itself has, the first half of it is really what the Green Mountain Care Board has to ensure an ACO meets the criteria the ACO has to meet in order to be certified to operate in the state. And then the second part is what they look at, the Green Mountain Care Board looks at when they do the ACO's budget review. So as far as the certification piece, this would add some things the Green Mountain Care Board needs to find in order to certify an ACO. Um, so the first on page three is that the ACO consults with the Agency of Human Services and its departments regarding public health and population health issues and coordinates its services and initiatives in these areas with the agent, with agency and departmental programming. Okay, so I, can you help us understand exactly what we're saying here? So, um, Sure, so um, this would require the Green Mountain Care Board to um, verify that the ACO is working with the Agency of Human Services and the departments in it. Um, when, when the ACO does things around public health and population health and the services and initiatives that the ACO is implementing um, are coordinated and consistent with what the Agency of Human Services and its departments are also doing. So keeping these areas aligned between what's happening in the ACO and what's happening uh, elsewhere as a result of efforts by state government. Okay, so um, 
it, as an example of this, would, we could, and I know because we've had discussions about RISE, both in this committee right. and in uh, appropriations, so this would suggest that before, would this include DSR spending? So before, um, before a program is initiated, uh, like a, a RISE program, that there would be some uh, uh, connection, evaluation, assessment, uh, look, look at by AHS. Right. So this, I mean, what you would be having with this language in the bill is you'd be having the Green Mountain Care Board looking to make sure that this, that, that kind of consultation happens and okay. doesn't, for purposes of um, the bill and the Green Mountain Care Board's work, it really wouldn't matter what the funding source was, whether it was, okay. you know, DSR investment funding or other type of funding that is what was supporting the ACO's work. It's really looking at the initiatives themselves um, and, and ensuring that those are coordinated. Okay, and then the, the next question I have is we know that there are three goals or things that the ACO is being measured on. For the all-payer model. For the all-payer model. So right. So with this link in with that, I'm thinking of the, uh, one of the goals being um, related to public health. Um, with this, no, I don't with have no, the... the with, okay, no, we'll, we'll, okay, we'll sort that one out later, but I'm just trying to figure out uh, whether or not um, this work that's going on would link in a, with an outcomes assessment. So I'm there's just, some consistency. Go ahead. What problem are we trying to solve? We're trying to solve a communications problem here between the agency and the ACO to ensure that there's coordination when state monies are used. Okay. Is this got to do with RISE and did the ACO it's and not just right. It's not, okay. It could be. Is I mean, that the one I, that brought? Well, it might be. I mean, I'll, we also think about uh, designated agencies and designated agency work uh, in mental health. And so if you start an initiative on suicide prevention, which is one of the outcome measures for the all okay, payer. We want to make sure that the ACO is not starting programs that may duplicate or not work in coordination with existing programs. Perfect. Thank you. No, thank you. Well said. <laughs> That's good. Just trying to figure out, once I know the problem, then I can figure out if we're solving. Okay, well this, that's why we're going through it, so this okay. is great. The two of you sound like Rachel Marx and Margaret Dumas. Yes, thank you. thank you. Which one is which? I'm not going to do it. You better walk you every tread like later. There's a little tight. <laughs> okay, Jen. So, Senator Westman. Can I just ask that the coordination with human services is absolutely where it's um, in, in that coordination, but we have um, a lot of um, nonprofit organizations, some of which get state grants to do stuff in that, that um, when we, I, I'm going through this right now in the DCF budget. Um, there's a can, whole, Jen, can you hear Senator Westman okay? Yes, I put you guys back on speaker, yes. Okay, good, thank you. When um, we're talking about um, um, home visits and the coordination with um, um, how that relates into early childhood and uh, th so the kids that are acting up, the kid that was biting in St. Albans, you've they got... Expelled from daycare. That yes, gets that expelled one. from daycare. <coughs> you get well child vi uh, visits that we're working towards. I've got five people in Lamoille well County Mental Health, which is not a state agency mm -hmm. doing work. I've got people in um, now um, one care that's beginning to fund mm -hmm. programs that are there. Um, when we say state organizations, does that also include the other nonprofit agencies that would be doing, um, taking a piece of all of this? So ask Jen, I have my own answer on that. Let me I'm answer. throwing that out yeah. on the table to make sure that we're clear about that. Does, yeah. Jen, can, does that, does the language with agency and departmental programming cover some, some of what Senator Westman is talking about or all of what he's talking about in terms of 
I think it would, I mean, it, it would include it to the extent that those, that the DAs and others were also coordinated with agency and departmental programming. I think there are other places, there may be other places and it might make sense to go through and, and take a step back and look at the, um, the overall statute that, the, that this would all be going into. There's a lot that's already in the law about coordinating with community partners, about not duplicating um, existing programs. So while this new language doesn't speak specifically to, uh, to the community partners, I think there's a fair amount in existing law that's already in there. I, I, um, I, I just, it is a concern of mine that we look at the whole picture um, as it comes to this, and, and at some point in this up front might want to just say that. Okay. Okay, and I'm just making a note. So I think maybe it would be good for us to um, to look at the whole existing statute because if there's language in there um, that is uh, that doesn't quite do what you want it to do, we can tighten those pieces up as well. Okay, that'll be that's actually a good homework assignment for us uh, to go through and identify places in the current statute uh, where we have questions. Whether or not we make changes is another thing. Because I know this, yeah. this section is 18 BSA 9382. Um, 9382. Yeah, it's a pretty long one. I know, I remember. But yes, yeah, there are things that you that any of you think need to change in the existing law, in addition to or instead of what's here in S290, we can certainly look at those. Okay. Um, all right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so in uh, further on toward the bottom of uh, page three, we have the next new language. So this is in um, as far as having healthcare providers participate, and this is this one's new language would say the ACO fosters collaboration among its participating providers, including hospitals and community providers and has established appropriate mechanisms for evaluating the extent to which these providers collaborate effectively. Any okay, so they would, one or keep moving? So let's just, let's just uh, digest this one a minute. So this doesn't say how it happens. It doesn't say you have to have care management. It doesn't say you have to have somebody walking across the hall. I mean, it just, it's an opportunity for, uh, to ensure that the hospitals and community providers are all connected and the ACO has some responsibility in making that happen so that it becomes a point of responsibility. Right. Then the question we would have to ask is how the evaluation takes place. And that's a, that's a question for the ACO. Uh, to. Right, and I think it's also a question for the Green Mountain Care Board because they yes. would be the okay. ones who would have to actually be carrying out this evaluation, you know, um, certifying that these things are occurring. Okay. Questions on this one? <coughs> well, my kind of general concern is just that every time we ask any of these entities to do more reviewing or more reporting, we're adding we're adding costs to the system and we're adding complexity and we're already being criticized for having you know too much government in in the in this whole process um, and it's still early on in in you know this all this trying to take place and I mean my inclination is just to let it play out the way it's already set up I mean I think we did a good job setting it up to begin with and I, I just worry that we're adding we're adding things on top that we don't we don't really need. I think that's what I, I'm yeah I feel like I'm monkeying with I know at one point this committee almost used the Green Mountain Care Board as its private research arm. Yeah we don't want that. And I'm still, yeah, I want to know what this is going to do to the, the personnel, the, the ability of the ACO to do all this, to know what the costs are, and then what the benefits are of having it done. So 
thinking about this and then <clears throat> thinking about the governance structure of the ACO, where you have so many different organizations sitting around the table, I think that it provides an opportunity for that group in particular to talk about how folks are working together. I don't see it as, I see it as an important principle. Now, whether it's redundant with another principle that we have in the whole thing, I think we have, I, I agree, we need to be sensitive to that. We can't, we can't keep piling on. We don't want to keep piling on. And yet we've heard, like when we went to Gifford, uh, we've heard that there's a need to pull things together and have that communication. So whether this is something we want to um, add on or whether it improves what currently happens, well, you know, this is a good question. Mm -hmm. And you should probably also, the Green Mountain Care Board is already doing a lot of work in this area, you know, largely because you have directed them to in this statute, but I think their execution of it may also help inform what you think may need to be added or not. So here's my thinking on that. I mean, here it's the Green Mountain Care Board, for me, is a regulatory organization. And looking at whether or not the outcomes, the goals are being achieved and measuring the outcomes, right? So I, that's the way I look at it. And the ACO ha, is, has become an autonomous organization that, that is um, building a, a system of care that includes community services and community folks and links in with our AHS programs. Okay, so we got that. So so if we give the Green Mountain Care Board the role of, of linking community services, then they not only become, they're not only regulatory, but they're carrying out. I, so I'm, this is, this is a confusion I really want to avoid, but I, uh, but, but go ahead. It, the, it, integrated within the ACO is measuring outcomes because their their payment structure is, exactly. is completely dependent upon that. exactly. So I don't know why we need to, and that's why I'm just well. Let's find out about adding more no, on to it. Let's find out if it's an add-on or if it is something that improves the work that's going on. I'm fairly oh, totally open to that. Senator McCarthy, I, I, I attended uh, Gifford as well, and I did not hear that they wanted more. Co coordination. They spoke of coordinating. They were talking about that that was something they were doing and that it was a good thing. But what I heard them say <coughs> that they needed was substantially more psychiatric nurses and beds. Mm -hmm. And they needed places to send violent patients. Right. Uh, so the question. Real, what, what this, uh, your, I was not your immediate predecessor, but several predecessors back. Doug Racine, when he was chair of this committee, used to warn always, he said, I hate bills that say, go forth and do good. <laughs> and that I worry that this doesn't pass the Doug test. Well, it's, it's just telling people, not sitting here. go out and do the right thing. No, but well, this doesn't say go out and do the right thing. This says make connections between community providers and um, and others in hospitals, and so what we don't hasn't have, that been our policy for years? I don't know. We'll have to we'll have to look look at the 18 BSA 9382. I'm I'm not gonna decide yes or no right now until we hear some more testimony. But it's a very good question that's been raised, and we've got it on the we've got it down. Good, right? I got gotcha. you. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if the, how the world's going to be different if we pass this bill or if we don't. Well, let's just find out what's that addresses in the bill. <clears throat> okay. All right. If this is just this one section yeah. that you guys have questions with, and so make sure you highlight it. And Jen's got it highlighted. And when we go through and read um, the statute on the ACO, we'll keep that one in mind. Okay. Okay, so the next uh, adding to language in, in existing law that um, the ACO has established mechanisms and care models to promote evidence-based health care, patient engagement, coordination of care, use of EHR, and other things. Um, this would add the ACO engages in ongoing and multi-year relationships with its participating providers and encourages the development of sustainable programs and initiatives. 
So that one, that one is really, uh, we could say, you'd be looking instead of at a one-year contract with folks, you're looking at a multi-year contract with folks. Right now, providers sign on for a year. Okay. Yeah, so. They can't sign on for more than a year? I don't know. Can they sign on for more than a year? I don't think I don't think that's happening right now. So this would just well, it's new, so I think yeah. I can understand the providers yeah. are risking their financial security. Exactly. I think one year is. Um, so we'll hear testimony on that, um, and whether or not uh, the fact is, if you have an ongoing relationship, it might reduce risk, or it might not, uh, and it might. Um, Give some reassurance. I, I would think if they can't sign up for more than a year, that's too prescriptive right. for us. Exactly. Because you know some of these changes take years to unfold, and why would we preclude them from going on more than a year? Let, um, you know, yeah. 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 We might. So Jen, in the current statute, is do you have an understanding of whether or not it can be for more than a year? I don't think it's. I don't think it speaks to the length of the contract. I don't think there's anything that stops it from from contracts from being longer than a year, other than the interest among the participants on either side for making it longer than a year. Okay. So Lucy. So Lucy Garen, uh, one here Vermont. I would just uh, Vicky can address this next week, but I would okay. caution um, getting into the contracts because if a program is not successful, you don't want it to. Okay, and we'll hear from her next week. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh huh. So next we get into uh, the second half of the statute, which is really focused more on the budget pieces, uh, the ACO budget review, and so this would add language that um, would specify that the Green Mountain Care Board would only be able to approve an ACO's budget that has salary increases in it for ACO employees if the ACO has met uh, its savings and quality targets for the preceding ACO budget year. Uh, and there may, may be some timing issues with that about when we know when they've met things. Um, and it would say that the board shall not approve an ACO's budget with salary increases. ACO has failed to achieve its savings or quality targets or both for the preceding ACO budget year. Um, okay. I'm sure we'll hear testimony on that. Okay. This and then the ACO the, is one care though, right? One care. Okay. Yeah. It's not the participating. No. Okay. It's one care. care. The ACO, ACO budget. Right. And I did run this by them, so okay. we'll hear from them. No. Yeah. Um, okay at one point. I don't know what they got at. Okay. Also says that the Green Mountain Care Board shall not approve an ACO budget if the total proposed administrative expenses, which is something the board would, does, does and would define, comprise more than 15% of the ACO's overall budget. I think the reality that we've, we've heard, uh, or I've heard, that the amount of their administrative expenses is far below that, one, yeah. one or two percent. It's like one or two or something like that. Yeah. yeah. So maybe we'll, uh, yeah, so that, that percentage is, was, a, was thrown in there as a right. placeholder. So whether we need to have that or not, we'll see. Right. Okay. Well, what's the percentage you use when you're looking at a charity? About that. 13 to 15. I thought that. it was more like 12 to 13. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that is the end of that particular section. And then it's the second section would add a new annual reporting requirement um, that would have the ACO submitting certain information to the Green Mountain Care Board annually when they do their budget submission. Um, and so it would have them submit a copy of the ACO's most recent audited financial statements prepared in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. The evidence basis on which, uh, on which each of the ACO's programs and initiatives was established and is being evaluated. Benchmark data, including the numbers of attributed lives by type of insurance or other coverage, quality metrics, and health outcomes. The ACO's outreach efforts to educate the public about the ACO's 
its impact to date on population health and other outcome measures. ACO's administrative costs, including salaries by category and the source of funds that covers those costs, and the amount, if any, of shared savings achieved by the ACO during the previous reporting year, how those savings were distributed, and the criteria the ACO uses to determine distribution of shared savings. And then it would specify that those quality metrics that would be reported pursuant to subdivision A3 must include an assessment of the services patients receive across the continuum of care, including primary care services, ongoing care management, appropriate counseling services, trauma-informed support services provided in the community, and other services that help patients to achieve positive clinical outcomes. Are these new things? So this we will hear from the ACO and the Green Mountain Care Board um, and as to whether or not it's an improvement because it's put in at the same time, but it also answers a lot of the questions that we hear all the time about information. So we'll, I, I think before we, we all, we all would have questions about this, obviously, but I think it's important that we take testimony. All right. Section three would direct the agency of human services in consultation with the Green Mountain Care Board and ACOs to look at the pros and cons of moving the ACO budget review process and those reporting requirements from a one year to a two year cycle. Um, and then it would have AHS report its findings and recommendations about moving to a two year cycle to this committee and others by December 1st. So this one, it seems to me, uh, might offer some, some freedom to the ACO in accomplishing its goals. Instead of constantly re preparing reports, um, they'd be able to get some of the work done if it were a two-year rotation. But I don't know, I, I don't know whether it's, I don't know whether we can, you can do that or not. And that's why it's a study in there. So. We'll hear from the Green Mountain Care. We'll hear from Green Mountain Care Board. We'll hear from ACO. And we'll hear from AHS on this one because it involves some other other dollars. All right. All right. Ready to move. So that is the end of, of the ACO the um, ACO part for the most part. Um, so just so just so we know that it, it, we've come to the end of the ACO section, but we have. Our homework is to go back and look at 18 VSA 9382, and we each of us has questions about each of those sections. And then, as we come to get to, get to our testimony, um, we'll be able to put those questions into into context. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so then we move into hospital. Um, rates, some information that the hospitals would be providing to the Green Mountain Care Board. So this is, um, the first part is in the context of their, um, the hospital budget review, when, they, when the hospitals file their budget information with the Green Mountain Care Board, and this would add a requirement that they, the hospitals provide information on the three specific health care services that were subject to the largest increase in commercial rates and the three services services that had the largest decrease in commercial rates during the previous fiscal year. So looking at, at um, big rate fluctuations. And then separately, it would require hospitals to report to the Green Mountain Care Board within 30 days following an increase of a half a percent or more to the commercial rate for any health care service that the hospital offers. Um, and I so and I have talked with the Green Mountain Care Board, and I think they will be, and the hospitals obviously will be um, weighing in on these sections. And what what value is there in looking at um, utilization for specific services? <coughs> and, you know, and again, I would just say, my, again, my concern is, are we, you know, every time we make hospitals do more reporting, we're also adding to the cost. So mm -hmm. it, yeah, we need to look at that, whether there's enough value added. And, uh, if they have the data, and but then the thing is, if utilization is going up in specialty services, and then mm -hmm. we're trying to move toward primary care, what's the relationship there? And, and then how do, we, how do we see that data? So yeah, good, yeah. Okay. Okay, 
Yep. Then we move into some sections that um, deal with Fremont Care Board and others. Um, so this first one, section five, would add a new duty for the Green Mountain Care Board to review the budget of annually of the designated specialized service agencies and preferred provider organizations. So the DAs and SSAs, I think you know, um, the preferred provider organizations are organizations certified by the health department to provide substance use disorder treatment in the community setting. So this would direct um, the Green Mountain Care Board in consultation with AHS and its departments to do an annual budget review uh, for each of those entities. And then it's, I based the language largely on the hospital budget review, but sort of modified to um, suit the context of the DAs, SSAs, and preferred provider organizations, um, which in some cases is different. Um, so it goes through the process, I don't know how detailed you want to look at this, uh, about having uniform formats for them to provide their financial scope of services and utilization data and information, designating a data organization um, with which each of the entities would provide, uh, would file that information and designating data organizations to process, analyze, store, or retrieve data and information would direct each uh, of the entities, each DA, DA, SSA, and preferred provider organization to follow certain, in, uh, file certain information with the board. Um, so a budget for the forthcoming fiscal year, financial information, including costs of operation, revenues, assets, liabilities, fund balances, other income, rates, charges, units of service, uh, and wage and salary data, uh, scope of service and volume of service information, including as applicable adult outpatient, community rehabilitation and treatment, substance use disorder treatment, developmental disabilities, children and family, emergency and advocacy and peer services, utilization information, any new services or programs that they're proposing for the next year, any known depreciation schedules on existing buildings and other facilities and equipment, and then anything else that the board would require. In conjunction with these budget reviews, the board would review the utilization information, consider the HRAP, the Health Resource Allocation Plan, as it pertains to the services provided by the entities, consider any reports from professional review organizations, solicit uh, public comment, and uh, meet with each of the entities to review and discuss their budget. Then it would have the board in consultation with AHS and its departments establish a budget for each of the DAs, SSAs, and preferred provider organizations annually on or before June 15th, followed by a written decision on or before July 1st. And, and then each of the entities would need to operate within the budget established um, by the board. It allows the board to adjust a budget um, if an entity requests it upon a showing of need based on exceptional or unforeseen circumstances. Um, and then it allows the board to request and requires the entity to provide information the board needs to determine whether they are operating within the budget that was established for them. And it allows the board to adopt rules. So right now the board and the DAs and the SSAs don't have a relationship. And this is a this is a lot in here, and the so the board and as I understand it, the Vermont Care Partners uh, are looking at this section. This was like this was just thrown together, not thrown together, but thoughtfully put together as a <laughs> placeholder. And um, so we will be hearing from the Green Mountain Care Board, and we will be hearing from uh, uh, DAs and SSAs. So you're visiting nurses. They're DA, right? No. They're not. No. no, they're not. Okay. Home health agencies. Home, home health, health agencies. agencies. We yes. put well, home health they agencies. They were talking to me yesterday. I'm kidding. No, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> how much are we increasing their budget so they can hire an accountant to put all this in? So, the, Senator, this is exactly why we're going to hear from the Green Mountain Care Board and the DAs and the SSAs as to what is possible, I think it is. there's some value in having the budgets evaluated at the board level as, uh, you know, we did this a few years ago and it, it helped us to adjust salaries and then how can we do that because there's a, there's a lot of 
state money, federal money, and private money involved in some of the decisions. That, so, um, There's also a point at which we cost more than we're worth, and you might want to think about going private. And it's a balance here. And the more time you spend reporting to us, there you go. The less time you have to deliver service, or the less money you have. The last I heard, all the home health people were operating, were not, did not have enough budget money to cover their costs. They were op operating on fundraising. Right. Every one of them. Right. That and then and we don't have home health in here. But it's but an area. Are, yeah, it's an area of concern. Well, the mental health agencies. Well, we have mental health agencies. Yeah, yeah. They, last I heard, they weren't doing any too well either. Exactly. That's why they're in here. So the question is, you know, how how can we look at what the budgetary needs are? What are the financial needs, and what is the current financial status of these organizations? They do a great deal of work for the state, and um, there's state money involved. So it's really an assessment at this point. And I can't wait to hear from the Green Mountain Care Board and the Vermont Family Partner, uh, for my care partners. What do, we, what do we ask hospitals to report? What do we, we ask for their depreciation we, schedules on all the buildings they own? Yeah, so this, most of this comes out of the hospital budget. Comes out of the review. hospital budget. Yeah. All right, that's that's how it got there. Right. It's a, it was a, a placeholder. Yeah. It's probably more than is necessary. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. But I think it's important to have that conversation. I think I'd have that conversation if I thought we could get them more money. But I'm I'm not seeing the carrot at the end of the stick. Yeah. That's that's Senator Westman and Senator McCormick's job, and you can and, and take, your job to take a stick and <laughs> not the stick carrot <laughs> appropriations. Not get the stick. <laughs> Do it or I'll tax you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Jen. Thank you for carefully walking us through that. Really, it's uh, snowing. It's I fine. think we're all we're, so everyone here at the table is all set with that section and ready to go. Right. Mm -hmm. No, we'll hear testimony on that section. The enthusiasm in this room is Everybody in this I know, I can see. We're, we will be taking testimony on this. And we have asked, we have a, a long list of people testifying next week, and we'll be collecting others to testify as we go along. We do want to improve whatever we can in here. And we're only halfway through the bill. <laughs> Jen, we are on page 12. Jen gets <laughs> <laughs> My favorite bill. All right, pay, are we on page 12, Jen? Page 12, section 6. We're ready to go to section 6. Section yes. 6 is language that should be familiar to the committee. This is language that would require at least one member of the Green Mountain Care Board to be a health care um, professional. So a physician, a naturopathic physician, a physician assistant, or a registered nurse or advanced practice registered nurse. Um, and it has the same effective date language that we've looked at in the past that says uh, it wouldn't necessarily disqual act to disqualify somebody who's currently on the board, who's not a healthcare professional, from serving another term or more terms if they were reappointed. Um, but the next new person on the board would need to be a healthcare professional. Do you know who else we don't have on the board? An insurance professional. I mean, when we started out, we set up the board to make health care decisions. They're now basically making a lot of health insurance decisions, and there is no representative of the insurance industry. Well, we didn't set, oh, yeah. we didn't set the Green Out Care Board up in the beginning to be the regulator. That's right. And yeah. more no. and more, they're moving toward mm -hmm. being the regulator. Mm -hmm. So from that point of view, what would we want on the board? Right. And, and, and at a stage where we're, theoretically, our goal is to transform to uh, within the ACO model. 
And so there's a lot of changes that are going on. Yeah. The Greenmount Care Board was supposed to operate in a post-insurance world. Yes, that's yes. right. right. You're, you're right. You're right. Yeah. yeah. That's what we set it up to do. Okay, so this section, uh, that's a good point, Senator, that you've made, and, and, but this section really is uh, reflects the bill that we passed out right, here last year. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm just saying this has been brought to my attention. Sure. Mm -hmm. That that's another place where we are missing. Okay, um, so now we're moving on to the board section seven, Jen, can we do that? Yep, so section seven starts the first of a few kind of related sections. Um, this is in the list of the duties of the Green Mountain Care Board and it would add to the duty um, of the board a duty to review and approve proposed health care contracts between health plans or other contracting entities and health care providers. So that's not something the board is currently involved in looking at contracts between payers and providers. Okay, and I've heard comments that there are just hundreds and thousands of these contracts and yeah. it would be impossible, but there might be some benefit to having um, some model contracts going forward. I, can't, I, I look forward to hearing from, from the board on this, and I've heard from a number of health care providers uh, at the hospital level, at the individual provider level, and other levels that are extremely concerned about um, the types of contracts are being handed from carriers. So I'll, I'll, we'll leave it at that and we'll hear testimony from folks. Okay. Okay. Um, and then the next section um, is a, kind of an, an expansion of an existing authority that the board has but has not used, which has to do with setting the amount, uh, the payment amount for health care services. Uh, under existing law, the board has the authority to set the maximum amount that a provider could accept for services, but it has not, what we've referred to in the past as rate setting, um, the board's rate setting authority. They have not exercised that authority. It's my understanding they would need um, considerable uh, additional staff to do so. Um, section 8 first starts by expanding the intent statement. Under existing law, we have it being the intent of the General Assembly to ensure payments to healthcare professionals that are consistent with efficiency, economy, and quality of care, and will permit them to provide on a solvent basis effective and efficient health services that are in the public interest. And then it goes on under existing law to talk about eliminating the shift of costs between payers of health services so that the amount paid to healthcare professionals is sufficient to enlist enough providers to ensure that health services are available to all Vermonters and are distributed equitably. This would add to that also an intent of the legislature to ensure equitable reimbursement amounts to providers regardless of setting or hospital affiliation while also allowing for facility fees if appropriate. So this is adding that concept of site neutral reimbursement where the reimbursement um, it's not based on hospital affiliation. And then in going through the rate setting statute, it directs the board to set not only reasonable rates, but reasonable site neutral rates, regardless of setting or hospital affiliation. Um, Questions there? Well, aren't we, it, isn't this fee for service? And aren't we trying to get away from this? So um, this, uh, this specifies, we're about to get to some language that says this should apply in both the fee for service and the uh, and amounts provided through the LPAIR ACO model. Um, because uh, there is still payment that goes on to providers. It's not necessarily on a fee for safe service basis, but there is still reimbursement. Um, it just happens through a different mechanism and, and um, different methodology. Right, and so, I mean, right now we're in a transition stage and for the next several years, we're in year, going into year three of the all-payer model and, uh, and there's still fee-for-service and there's fee-for-service for specialty care, which is maybe inequitable depending on the site. So this, this covers both, both of those things and it's hard to write something for a transition, right? <laughs> but moving forward. Is this dealing in any way with the fact that the private practice physical therapists get paid a small percentage of what the hospital affiliated 
That's what this would, this would look at that, but okay. it would include an assessment of facility fees because obviously you have a big, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. You'd have to look at overhead. It's a lot of work. I don't know, you know, and this is, this would be, this would be happening at the board level and uh, it costs some money to do this. Which we will have to talk about and I know the board will be responding to this section as well others as well perhaps our director of health care reform but let's see okay so i haven't looked at all the language but it's all pretty consistent with with what we've been talking about the board wouldn't be the board would be allowed as under existing law to consider legitimate differences and costs among health care professionals but it would specify that the board shall not create reimbursement disparities for the same services based on the healthcare setting in which the services are delivered or the healthcare professional affiliation or lack of affiliation with the hospital. And then um, in talking about establishing uh, and improving payment methodologies, uh, I'm going on to page 16, the payment methodologies as under current law must be consistent with payment reform and evidence-based practices. Um, and then I specified shall apply to the reimbursement amount provided to healthcare professionals through the all payer ACO model. And then, uh, as under existing law, may include fee for service payments to the extent the board determines those payments are appropriate. So, again, this, this really moves the board into that regulatory role, in the, given where we are with our um, payment reform. It, right, and this rate setting authority is. Uh, already in our current law, although it hasn't been exercised, this would add some specific language around site neutral reimbursement. Okay. We ready for section nine? Any questions around the table? That this one, this, this one is a huge. This is like slightly a heavy lift. Yeah. Minor minor detail. <laughs> so, but I think that uh, this is. This is a, a significant issue out there in the healthcare world, and it is one of the things that is driving a loss of healthcare providers in the state, um, especially in rural areas. So I think we need to be very aware of it. And how do we how do we solve it? I mean, this is one way of solving this problem. How do we do it? We can put more money into Medicaid. That would also help, but we don't have it right now. Okay. All right, then the, um, now we're going back to this idea of the contract between the payers and the providers and having the Green Mountain Care Board review those. So this would specify that a con health care contract between a health plan or other contracting entity and health care provider will not be effective until it has been reviewed and approved by the Green Mountain Care Board for fairness, adherence to those rate parameters and the rate setting um, done by the board, and consistency with the with provisions of existing law in um, chapter 22, I'm sorry, chapter 221, subchapter 2 of um, Title 18, which deals a lot with the relationship between payers and providers. I think we better all read Title 18 thoroughly. Yes. I'm yeah. sorry? I think we all here sitting at the table are going to have to read Title 18 pretty thoroughly. At least some of us will. But, yeah. yeah. You may want to focus on certain areas. It's yeah, really that, <laughs> I'm thinking that. Um, so then for health insurers, um, looking at the uh, health insurance rate review, this is section 10. Can we just stick with uh, section 9 for a second and see if there are comments or questions, concerns? More, A little bit more on that topic a little bit further on. Okay, then let's go. Okay. So... Right now we're taking a little break here and going into health insurance, directly into health insurers and health insurance rates. Um, under existing law, health insurance rates um, must go through a rate review, rate and form review process. The rate review happens, as you know, with the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, and the board must determine whether a rate is affordable, promotes quality care, promotes access care, protects insurer solvency, and is not unjust, unfair, inequitable, misleading, or contrary to the laws of the state. This would add some language specifying that a proposed rate increase shall be <coughs> just. Uh, if the, and I think I was, I think this is an error on my part in the drafting, I, uh, I think it was supposed to be if the um, 
proportion of the rate increase attributable to administrative expenses exceeds the cumulative consumer price index rate of inflation for the applicable period. Basically, if the administrative expenses are going up faster than uh, the rate of inflation. And we didn't specify medical inflation. We specified... No, specify medical inflation. Mm -hmm. Medical inflation um, totally. goes up at a much faster rate than... Right. Anything. So we've put in a CPI for... Right. You could More decide to put in a inflation. different rate. This is a one option for okay. an index. Okay. A benchmark. All right. And then section 11, now we're back to the contracts between the payers and the providers. Um, so this is in an existing statute on fair contract standards. There's a lot of requirements for what has to be in the contracts and be part of the contracting process. So this does a couple of things. The first is to remove the language on confidentiality. Under existing law, um, on page 19, you'll see crossed out, but contracting entities may require healthcare providers to execute written confidentiality agreements with respect to fee schedule and claim edit information received from the contracting entity. This would eliminate that. Um, and then going on to page 20, um, under existing law, when a contracting entity proposes, presents a proposed healthcare contract for consideration by a provider, the contracting entity has to provide or make reasonably available certain information. This would specify that the contracting entity must provide at least 120 days for the provider to consider the proposed contract and for negotiation of contract terms, including reimbursement amounts. Um, it would also specify that healthcare contracts must be for a minimum of two years and include reimbursement amounts that are consistent with the rate parameters set out by the Green Mountain Care Board. And prior to a healthcare contract taking effect, it must be reviewed and approved by the Green Mountain Care Board for fairness, adherence to the rate parameters set by the board, and consistency with the provisions of this subchapter um, and other applicable laws. And then it would also, again, take out language saying that um, it, the requirements don't prohibit a contracting entity from requiring a reasonable confidentiality agreement between the provider and the contracting entity about the terms of the proposed contract. So this is doing a couple of things. It's giving, specifying the amount of time, minimum amount of time for the provider to consider the proposed contract and to do negotiations. It's eliminating some confidentiality provisions around what's in the proposed contract, and it's requiring Green Mountain Care Board approval of the contract. There's a lot here. We're going to hear from the board, um, and uh, it it does change uh, the relationship between providers and uh, contracting entities, such as a, a insurance carrier, but. Um, there is a lot of information out there, and I don't know if anybody else has been contacted from folks, but I have, and I have received some anonymous uh, uh, envelopes, large envelopes, looking at contracts that have been forced, foisted, foisted on providers without negotiation. Uh, it seems to me it's not a, a fair process, so that's why I asked to have this put in. Uh, we'll see what happens. But I certainly want to hear from the board. We're going to have to hear from carriers. We're going to have to hear from everybody about this and what the implications are. Okay. All right. We're almost done with the walkthrough. So Sex 12 um, would direct the Agency of Human Services in consultation with the Greenmont Care Board, the Department of Human Resources, and the unions for state employees and public school employees to determine the likely effects of attributing and not attributing state and public school employees who are getting insurance through the state or the uh, schools and their dependents to an accountable care organization. Specifically, the agency is directed to consider the expected impact of attribution and non-attribution on the employee's access to health care, the employee's health outcomes, the employee's experience of the health care system, the relative value of the employee's uh, employer-sponsored health benefits if they both are or are not attributed to an ACO, and the state's likelihood of meeting the scale targets contemplated by the all-payer model and the related effects on health care reform efforts in Vermont. So looking at you know what, what's involved in attributing 
the public employees, state employees, and, and uh, teachers and other school employees to the ACO? What does that look like from their standpoint? What does that look like from the state uh, standpoint? And it would have AHS report its findings and recommendations about attribution by October 15th. So, so this uh, this is really comes out of the concerns that we've heard about a loss of benefits if there, if uh, folks went to the ACO, and uh, we can we'll have testimony on this because I think there already is information, but we'll we'll see what we get. And that's basically it. Then we get into the effective date. All payer models. Sorry. Go go ahead. Different for different different for different parts. Yep. Different dates for different things. Which we can go through, but may make more sense to go through as we individually consider different parts of the bill. Yeah, okay. So, wow, look at all those sections. Thank you, Jen. Boy, there's a lot of work in here, but just for the dates. I don't know if we can all keep that straight. <laughs> um, questions for Jen. Yeah, there's some things in here that we, we feel uncomfortable about, I think, as a committee, and there's things in here that we feel that are important to resolve in some, one way or another. There are things in here that um, Nolan will have fun on a fiscal note with and trying to sort that out. Uh, and so we'll be taking testimony. I think I, we have a day next week, Dory, like, is it Wednesday? We have folks scheduled in. Uh, on 290, yes, yeah. Wednesday. And so that'll be the beginning of testimony. I think we'll be taking a couple of days of testimony. We need to hear from people. If you have not yet signed up with Dory, this is the time to do it. This is a great day to do it. <laughs> and any questions? Do you have any comments, Nolan? Do you want to? Do you want to give us some comments right now? Sure. All right. Well, come out. We don't have a fiscal note. No, no at least you'll be identifying. It's something. 17 pages of colors and numbers. Oh, good. But and as it is now, knowing that there's if, no fiscal yeah, note. For the yeah. record, no language language yeah. fiscal note. Uh, mine's more of just an overlying comment of um, just to be mindful of. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in here that we're telling the Green Mountain Care Board to do. Okay. Um, much of it would require staff contracts, etc. And uh, several moments ago, we just talked about how the Green Mountain Care Board was created in a different world in a different time. And so, and then on top of that, I was also recently heard their budget. And you know, how they're, you know, how they're, what they're doing to keep their budget level funding and how they have increases in their health insurance costs and they're offsetting with contracting costs, etc. So the point is, is that uh, you know, just think about, be mindful of what it is you want the Green Mountain Care Board to do and how you pay for it. For instance, uh, if you, you know, right now with the budgeting process for the hospitals, we build back the hospitals. Right. Uh, I don't think, I don't, I, I think I could speak by saying I don't think anyone is having a, you know, a desire to build back the DAs. Right. To do budgets. Right. To look at their budgets. There's, there's a lot of complexity in this. So it's more complicated. And so and a good chunk of the Green Mountain Care Board budgets come from build back. Right. But they can build back the entities in which they're regulating. So to the extent that we put more work on them that is not a regulatory function that comes a general fund. If it is a regulatory function, we're gonna start building back even the hospitals and the insurers and the ASO even more which comes back another way. So I'm just, it's more of like uh, helping you think about as you work, walk through this, think about what, what it is you want them to be doing. What is it, they, you know, maybe, so that's, this that's is what helpful. I was, that's I what mean, I was gonna say. Yeah, very helpful. I'm, in fact, I have up on my little, what do you call those little things you have up there where you contact? Yeah, I have the Green Mountain Care Board statute right there and I've been reading it and going mm -hmm. through it, trying yep. to sort out, is there things that we can, shift over to um, Director of Health Care Reform, <clears throat> things that we can shift other places and and, uh, and so that we can move forward with a more of a regulatory en entity. And I, you know, I, I don't know, so we'll so have to look at that. This is that's a big, that's a big job. Just to follow 
follow up on what Nolan said. Yeah. They were developed with a certain vision. That vision never really happened exactly the way that you know, rolled out the way we thought it was going to. And now we're moving them into a regulatory place. Mm -hmm. What is our real vision of where we see the ACO and um, the Green Mountain Care Board in the overall? Mm -hmm. And what are the pieces to that? For me, it's really the ACO is doing the payment reform, and we want the Green Mountain Care Board to oversee that in a regulatory fashion. Mm -hmm. But we want the ACO to do the payment reform piece. Mm -hmm. the, as I heard testimony, we see the ACO moving into the public health area, mm -hmm. and we're worried about the coordination with mm -hmm. all of the other groups, including the Agency of Human Services doing. Mm -hmm. One thing I see is a lack in what they're all doing is we're all kind of in a higgledy-piggledy way that might um, going into the um, recruitment of the people to do the work. Mm -hmm. And um, I like that. Can we put a higgledy-piggledy no, in? I don't care it's how a yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, it's a category. Term, but yeah, in those pieces, so in the overall, what's our view? of where the Green so, Mount Care Board fits in that, and how is our view of what we want them to do different than it was before? And so, really you remember, the last time we looked at this bill, and, and I think you and I agree on this, we all agreed that we tr try to lay out our vision for what we see mm -hmm. as moving forward, healthcare reform, and, and, and for the board, and Nolan, you really, you know, I mean, you actually hit the nail on the head. We're asked to do things that are, we're no longer doing. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think yeah. um, the whole idea about uh, work, you know, workforce, is, workforce, I mean, that's what mm -hmm. I think we really ought to be focused on because that's where we can well, actually I help. How, you know, what are the measures that we can do to, to right. bring more and, and I don't really see with the ACO if they're, in the front on payment reform to keep people in the thing, they also need to be a piece of the recruitment. Mm -hmm. Because there's a hand in hand if you're gonna do the payment with that. So um, let's let's hold that thought and, and then just one Yeah, no, I understand and I understand we understand. We thoroughly understand the need for workforce. That's why we've looked at PAs, that's why we're looking at the nurse compact. That's why we're going to continue working collaboratively with the Appropriations Committee on where we put our money in for workforce development and expanding nursing programs as much as we can. But that, that's not in this bill. Yep, I, but we know that is a very important issue, and we, we, know, we all agree on that. Uh, but the, the, this is another, there are a lot of big issues that we face here, and this is one of them. So. If there's something we can do to modify the bill that would help the Green Mountain Care Board, um, we need to help them. They're they're overwhelmed with everything that goes on. Mm -hmm. um, we've we've so. given them a lot of work over the years. And Absolutely. Taken on, they've done a great job. And we haven't taken anything away from them, but they don't mm -hmm. want to give anything up either. They're enjoying their work. You know, this is another issue. So, what, so we'll have to talk about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. is the funding mechanism we set up appropriate? Yes. And enough. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so you, so right now they do health care reform and they do regulatory oversight. So maybe health care reform moves somewhere else. I don't know. Uh oh. Big question. All right. Ina's looking like she could take on health care reform. That is her job. Okay. She, she left the board to get away from it. I know. I know. Just to get back to her. Yeah, right. back to her. <laughs> okay, thank you, Nolan. Yeah, stimulating good conversation. We're, okay. So, uh, you know, I was thinking uh, we're at a point where we could move on to our next bill. I, I, there's, everybody in the room has something to say. I know that. And we'd love to hear from you. But let's do it in a more formal way, because this is a huge bill. And I know uh, in, in meeting with the Green Mountain Care Board and with uh, Vermont Care Partners and the hospitals and others that there are suggestions that will be coming in for improvement to the bill. 
and not the least of which is uh, our health care reform director. So we have everybody coming in with some improvements to the bill. We need to listen and to, to the testimony, and we've got all of our own ideas. And I, I, I think, you know, listening to Richie, improving the bill is what kind of starting in the middle, and maybe we need to go back yeah. to the beginning mm -hmm. and say, this is what we need to have happen. Right. And it's very different than what we wanted or needed to have happen when we thought yes. we were going to be single payer. So what do we need to have happen now? And what's the yes. best way yes. the, to make sure that it happens? And so a lot of what you're seeing in here are things that I guess we heard on HROC that, need, that maybe we need to have happen. And then some of my ideas about what would help, and so we'll have to, we'll have to talk through. And maybe all of some this. things need to go back to yeah. financial regulation, which is where well they used to be. Well, that's yeah. a conversation. Well, you send it back to DFR. Let's let's have that conversation. If you send rate setting back to DFR, healthcare rate setting, what is left at the Green Mountain Care Board, and how do you ensure coordination between insurance companies and providers? And so if we're moving toward an ACO, if we're an all-payer model, then what is it that the DFR is going to be doing? So that's a, that's a question we all need to think and about. And I think that going to an all-payer model, again, is an experiment for us. You know, it's yeah. not health care reform in the sense of going to single payer. I mean, that was post-insurance. It was overturning right. the entire system. This is kind of realigning the system. Yes. But and it's not the complete overhaul. You know, I always talked about the ocean liner that we were trying to strip down and rebuild in the middle of the ocean and not lose anyone or any of the other smaller craft mm -hmm. attached. This is kind of reorganizing the deck. Or well, but it is, but it is the next know. best hope. It is the next best hope. To, uh, but the question is, I think it's the tugboat. I, I, really, I think this is more than reorganizing it, the deck. Okay, so it yeah. may be, I, but I, I, I think I, that's it what is a very, it's a yeah. challenge. This yeah. bill is so challenging to so many different people and entities that I think it, it does challenge us to, to do things differently. And so it offers transparency for how rate setting is made. Right now, there is no transparency on that. When a, when a carrier goes into the Green Mountain Care Board with an increase in rates, whatever it is, 10%, 20%, 8%, and the negotiation begins with that request. It doesn't begin with all the actuarial data and analysis. So I'm, you know, I think, um, anyway, that's I am. Okay. Did you want to say something? I'm sorry. Senator. Me? No. Okay. We have a lot to, we have a lot to deal with in here, and I think it begins with the testimony from folks. And we can then begin to sort it out. And I know there'll be suggestions for language change. So uh, our assignment is, if we accept it, I like the suggestion. What's our vision going forward for the Green Mountain Care Board? What's our vision going forward for health care reform? And um, read through those sections of Title 18 and Title 18 that relate to the bill itself. Jen, thank you for go taking the time to educate us yet again. No problem. All right, so I think what we should do, and since you're on the phone, let's just dive into 288 and look at uh, the language that other people have brought. So we're finished with S290 for the day, but we'll be back. And if you have, if any of you uh, haven't signed up, please do sign up, and I'm also happy to meet with people. Okay, and then, Jen, we have a draft 
1.3 from you? Right, it's the same one we went over the other day. Okay, okay, then what about the requests that we had from Jennifer, Jennifer Costa and Gail Zatz? Um, have they, I... They haven't, did they, they sent something to me, did they send something to you? Um, yes. Uh, well, yeah. Why don't we just talk about what it is that they sent, and then your comments back to me and your analysis back to me on those would be very helpful. Okay. Um, and so put us into the section of Bill where they were making suggestions and so pick your, make your okay. choice. What? S288, I found it, draft 1.3. Yes. Okay, that's on Tuesday. Yeah, it's on today's Tuesday. And so, yes, I think oh, it did not pop up on my today. So. Yeah, but just you have to refresh. All right. Well, I got Tuesdays and then the same. So there was a request from Gail Zat, who represents cannabis, to um, to exempt medical uh, THC, and then there was a request from Jennifer Costa to change some definitions. So. Jen, why don't, why don't you put us in the section of the bill and start with either one, whichever one you would like. I think we're probably more familiar with the definition, so start with Jennifer Costa. Okay, so um, she sent various versions. I think she actually has two issues. One of them is definitions and one of them is possession. Um, so for definitions, uh, she has sent me various iterations of um, requests to change the, the definition, either around getting rid of e-liquids, putting something about substances in the definition of echo substitute, um, and, and then yet late yesterday she sent a list of um, new definitions that she wanted to change things to based on some other organizations or definitions that have been vetted by other organizations. And I guess my overall response to all of this is I'm not sure what problem it's looking to solve. Um, so I, um, I'm not sure that the definitions that are being proposed make anything clearer and in some cases I think create potential inconsistencies throughout our other tobacco and smoking statutes. Oh, that would be good. And changes language that seems to be working now. Um, so I'm not really sure, uh, you know, what the what the gain is. I think if there are specific concerns that they have with the existing statutes or language that's in the bill, I'm happy to address those directly. But taking on a new, replacing our existing set of definitions and terminology throughout the statutes with a new set of definitions that aren't familiar to the people who administer and enforce the laws doesn't seem like it's a, like it's a game. Um, so we've gone, I, you know, I've gone back and forth with her a number of times on various parts of the language, but, but really my, uh, and, and frankly, I tried to take a step back and say, am I just, you know, being attached to my language because I drafted it? <laughs> um, somebody else's language, but I don't think that's it. I just don't know how it fits with what we currently have. Okay. Like the fact that it would add things like tobacco substitutes and e-liquids into our definition of tobacco products, and then elsewhere in our smoking statutes, we talk about use of lighted tobacco products um, or use of tobacco substitutes. If you put tobacco substitute in the definition of um, tobacco products, you at least have to take it out of other parts of the statute, but then you still got the issue of whether it's actually lighted or not. I, I just don't know what the what the purpose would be of changing, completely overhauling our existing definitions, unless we really want to kind of take a step back and, and start over and redo our tobacco statute, which... Uh. Um, Does anyone want to do that? No. No. <laughs> okay. I have a question. Will, so my, we'll let someone else do that another day. Okay. I do have a question. Yeah, we, uh, Senator Ingram has a question. Um, so, Jen, um, these disposable pods um, that I've been reading about, are they included in our definition in this? 
288 with AB band also flavored ones? I believe so because of the way it um, because of the way it's written, which has e-liquids being the solution substance or other material used in or with a tobacco substitute that is heated or otherwise acted upon mm -hmm. to produce an aerosol vapor or emission to be inhaled by the user. So I mean I think I think that is broad enough that it 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 includes liquids, it includes solutions, it includes substances, it includes other materials that get heated. Okay, yeah, so it's right. to really be as broad as possible, right? That our definition. Right, I'm trying to keep it, so I think that the, some of the challenge here and some of what we were going back and what I was going back and forth with Jennifer on yesterday is you want to be broad enough to anticipate what may be coming out, like there are now right. gels that are used to describing something specifically as a liquid, I think is a problem because it wouldn't include gels and who else knows what else comes out, but going so broad that you're not putting it in any context having to do with e-cigarette, you could be banning orange juice because it's flavored, you know, because it has a flavor. I mean, you know, you have to, I think you have to put it in some sort of context that is related to um, e-cigarette e vaping something. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, so I have a little proposal, Madam Chair. I would be willing to do Oh, wait. wait, okay. Sorry. Okay, we're not finished yet. All right, I'm sorry. Good. We'll talk. Oh. All right. I just have this great idea. <laughs> <laughs> I want to share. Hold on. Uh, so, we, Jen, there was also another, there were a couple, two other suggestions that we have to go through. What was the other one? Right. So, they, so there's a couple of others from the um, tobacco, uh, the, you know, the Cancer Association and others. Um, one of them has to do with Possession. So we had specifically taken out of, uh, on this latest draft, taken out the possession language, uh, the, the ban on possessing, purchasing, or attempting to purchase um, flavored tobacco products, flavored e liquids, and flavored what, tobacco. What's, do you know what section you're in? Uh, sorry, I'm looking at email. We are in, I think we're pretty far in the it's in, in 1043, let's see. It is in, it is on page, bottom of page 16, and it's crossed out. Oh, I got it, okay. Um, so I think there are a few, so they, as you may remember from last year, are interested in um, eliminating penalties for possession generally. Um, which you declined to do last year, but in, in the new draft that I had brought to you, I had added um, e-liquids into the existing possession ban, which may not be what you want, because again, it goes to the issue of possession. So I think there's a couple of questions for you in here. One of them is, do you want, um, do you want to maintain any penalties for possession under age? Uh, and so right now, uh, the on page 17, we have the person violating. Does that include people under age and for, for, for possession? Well, no. No. You, because you took out the possession, it's really the, uh, it's the right. sale, offer for sale, give, provide, transport, manufacture, or, or otherwise distribute these products that is subject to the penalty on page 17. Okay. Um, so uh, the part that's crossed out would eliminate the um, fine, the traffic ticket for possession for underage. <coughs> Am I saying that correctly? On page 16. So yes and no, be okay. because of language elsewhere that I'm now going to, I think it's in section 1005, uh, let me just get there. Uh, yes, yeah, so section 1005, which is on page, I'm trying to tell you what page, on page eight, existing law, says a person under 21 years of age shall not possess, purchase, or attempt to purchase tobacco products, tobacco substitutes, 
I, I had added in this draft e-liquid, which we had added everywhere, or tobacco paraphernalia, unless the person is working, you know, it, it helps yeah. them in the course of their job, um, unless they work for, you know, a convenience store or something. So, um, so in this section, if you added e-liquid, then even though you had said possession of flavored e-liquid was not a violation regardless of age, later on in the bill, you would be saying possession of e-liquids, whether flavored or not flavored, under age is a violation and you get the, the traffic. The bond. traffic ticket. No. Yeah, so, so, um, so I think the first question here is what you want to do with respect to possession and then we should look separately at the purchase or attempt to purchase because you may have a different feeling on that. So the possession is now the traffic fine? Yeah, so under existing law, possession is a traffic, a traffic fine. What has not been specifically spelled out is whether possession of the liquid separate from the e-cigarette itself is a, is a traffic violation. Um, so we've never really broken out this idea of the e-liquid, the substance that, that goes with it, goes with a tobacco substitute because when I wrote the tobacco substitute statute, they were generally all one thing, um, well, you know, all one product. Um, so you've never really looked at the issue of possession of the pod, the liquid, separately from um, possession of a tobacco substitute. So I'm, I've sort of teed up this question by adding e-liquid in here, uh, and I think the what was uh, the point that the advocates were making is um, because they do not support a penalty for possession. I would say no. At all. Why do you need it? Um, and you had agreed to take the possession penalty out. No of section 1013 for flavored liquids and other flavored products. Um, it did not seem consistent to them to put, a, to, to maintain or add a penalty for possession of liquids, flavored liquids or unflavored liquids for people under 21. Okay. Am I making sense? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. I don't know. I, if kids possess them, they're going to smoke them. But there's just a base problem with starting a young person out. We tried it with the possession of alcohol. You lost, and we got all these people driving around 10 years later with a suspended license because they got caught walking around with a can of beer when they were 17. Um, well, this isn't literally. I mean, it's done by the... Right, but in general, in my experience, people get irate over parking tickets. I can't tell you how many people used to call me about their parking tickets um, in my former life because people don't perceive parking 10 minutes over the limit is a crime. I've never had anyone scream because they got a ticket for running a red light or for speeding or because there's a general perception that there's danger to yourself and others there. But to make something a criminal offense that... Not a criminal offense. No, but I mean to make it you get a ticket, you go to court. That, that's, if you're selling it, you're an adult, you know you're doing what you're not supposed to do, then fine, we nail you. To start nailing kids because somebody finds them with a thing in their pocket. We're thinking about all the um, here, and we saw this offer, so guess what? You know, um, and that's right. Oh, it's not just mine that those things suddenly start talking to you. It's the newest scam. Ads suddenly start talking out of nowhere, even though the sound's off. 
Um, no, it's happened to me in here. But it's a high tech nuisance. It's, it's a high tech nuisance, yeah. But anyway, I, I just, you can't sell them. You can't buy them. How far do we want to go to stop kids from going to New Hampshire, which they will? You, we, even New Hampshire's not going to be able to sell them because the feds have banned flavored products. So how, you know, you don't want to create a basic disrespect for the law because you're making, you're punishing somebody for something they don't see as wrong. And I just, I just have a problem doing that. Okay, so suggestion then is to keep that section crossed out. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I don't think it's a question of whether to keep that section crossed out, yeah. but whether to put some, whether to make a change in section 1005, which starts on the toward the bottom of page eight, around possession. So section 1005 around possession uh, prohibits. Possession, purchase, or attempt to purchase by people under 21. It prohib also prohibits misrepresenting age to purchase or attempt to purchase. And then it has the um, the penalty for someone who possesses. So if you were interested in removing penalties for possession, we could maintain penalties for purchasing and attempting to purchase and misrepresenting age mm -hmm. to purchase, but get rid of the references to possession. Mm -hmm. How's that go? So, <clears throat> I mean, what do people think about So that? that would be for just people under 21 now. Yeah. Right, because you had already taken out the language else. and the um, possession, purchase, or attempt to purchase by people generally. Uh, on the flavor stuff. So, I mean, one thing that may be useful is just to separate the concepts of possession and purchase. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think that's yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Makes a whole lot of sense. I can see a whole lot of problems arising otherwise. And so we could, you know, even in the flavored side, we could ban. Uh, purchase or attempt to purchase, although they should not be, also should not be being sold, so maybe that's moot. Yeah. On the flavored stuff. So um, I think that could get your uh, sting people in trouble. They send in underage people. They're already, they're attack. always, there's yeah. a whole thing saying if they're part of the sting, they're okay. Yeah. They're yeah. okay. Yeah, right. And, okay. and just yeah. FYI, um, uh, economic development is, is going to be going through whatever we finish with this to ensure that it fits with uh, their jurisdiction. And I'd like to know, we're saying you get a traffic ticket. Yeah. Well, it's in the manner of a traffic ticket. Okay. Because it goes through the Judicial Bureau. All right. It's not the traffic ticket that we've put five hundred dollars worth of fees on. That I think it's two hundred that people can't pay and are driving around without a license. Uh, I, just I don't want to be setting kids up for future. Right. I don't yeah. believe so, but let me yeah. look. Um, let me just look at the judicial bureau stuff and see how that works. So, help, help me a little bit here. So. Um, I get the purchase here in that, in the, um, but it's the possession piece in the transferring data. If you're an adult, you're in Barrie, you take the bus to Aquasosny, you buy a um, 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 menthol cigarettes and to bring them back with your friends. Mm -hmm. What happens to you? If you take them back and you do what with them? You share them with people? You sell them to people? Can't sell. You smoke them. You smoke them. If you smoke them personally, if there's no ban on possession, then it's not a, then you haven't violated anything. Right. And, but if you're um, um, an 80 year old that goes over and buys them and gives a, um, brings back a, um, 
uh, a pack and gives it to the other folk in the old age home. Well, then you have given or provided or otherwise distributed them. So you may have violated the new statute. And when I walk by someone, can an enforcement officer tell if they're menthol or straight tobacco? Strawberry, yeah, but can, is there mint? Let me, you are asking the wrong person. I okay, know. but I'm, I'm just thinking we've not done other things here and we've been talking about minorities. But, I mean, but you, have, you, you have not banned possession. So, we have banned so. cigarettes not, would not be breaking the law. We're not banning possession, right? Yeah, yep. Is there anybody here who wants to banning smoking enforce uh, have an enforcement action on possession? Nobody wants that around the table. That's what I'm hearing. Right. Okay. So I'll take possession out so everyone. Yeah. Um and and do you okay, so possession we, we have decided under twenty one, over twenty one, no ban on possession. Right. Okay. Um so the second question then is uh, purchase or attempt to purchase. Do you want all state employees are going home at noon? Okay, I, I just canceled down. Can Jen hold on a second? We have we have a question. So um, public safety is like say all the people that can do the budget are going home at noon because the governors and our Pro tem said it's up to the committee chairs that we are Vermonters and we should be able to um, top it up. Yeah. <laughs> I am a Vermonter and I've driven since 1973 and never made it, you know, made it when a, we've had more snow maybe than this. So um, I can't see any point in meeting if we don't have any witnesses. Yeah. And I can't <laughs> tell them my staff when their bosses yeah. said they can go home, uh, they got to stay for me. So, um, we're canceled. you've canceled already? I canceled because my witness couldn't go over the bill because he was at home. <clears throat> okay, so. Yeah, I, I, so, yeah. it's foolish, but it is what it is. I think you're on the spot. You might as well cancel. Yeah. Well, I could sit down at the end of the table and <laughs> testify. <laughs> <laughs> would you like to, Senator? So we'll come testify. We, we have we have Ledge Council on the phone, but we're, uh, we're yeah, because they're not in. All right. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. Uh, well, Senator uh, Ash is not officially. It's up to the chairs. I know. So, uh, so what, is this your canceling this afternoon? <laughs> or you should be I, I didn't hear an answer. Because I don't have. Uh, she I don't have can't. anybody. I don't have any witnesses. Yeah. But if you want to sit around and chat with me, I'll be there. <laughs> you and I are having a chair. I've got a whole mile. Uh, Jen, thank you for uh, What's happened? being so patient. It's February. It's I know, really and truly. Okay, so 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 where are we then? We purchase or attempt to purchase. Attempt to purchase or attempt to purchase. Right. So then you have. Um, do you want to? Uh, do you want to maintain a prohibition on people under age purchasing or attempting to purchase? Now, w would that in would that involve a um, a traffic fine or the larger fine? Yeah. No. Well, it depends. So I, I sort of have a separate question on under twenty one, and then uh, and then under over and under twenty one, twenty one and over, and under all people with flavored. Product. Right. Um, which, you know, shouldn't be getting sold if you're banning the sale of them. So maybe you don't need to address attempting to purchase or purchasing flavored products. Well, what if they go over to the guy that was in last week that's moved to smoke shop across the river? Well, they can go to New Hampshire. They can purchase it there. They yeah. can. But they can. Right. Well, they're 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 if they're getting it doesn't, sold, yeah. I, I'm yeah. not sure. So you can't stop, you, you can't regulate behavior that happens outside That's of the state. A, yeah, right, right. Even if you can with sales tax. Right, so for the most part, it depends kind of where the transaction occurs and the nexus with Vermont that the business has. For tax purposes, there may be different relationships with um, the state, but 
uh, but somebody going across the border and purchasing something in New Hampshire that is legal for purchase in New Hampshire, I do not believe you can prevent that. You could so attempt to prevent them from bringing it back into the state, but you're not banning possession. That's hard to do. Yeah, that's true. That's uh, it's the only argument for not banning possession. Because if they get it somewhere else, they can bring it back over. And we, have we, we can't ban everything. <laughs> Okay, so there's still a traffic ticket, however, for under 21. Under right. 21. So not traffic ticket per se, but in the manner of a traffic ticket. Right. 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 And how much is that? It's twenty-five dollars for a twenty-five dollars. Okay. First, I think for first, and let me just go. Uh, twenty. It's twenty-five dollars, and then if someone misrepresents their age by using false identification to purchase, um, then it's fifty. $50 or ten, up to 10 hours of community service or both. And that's just a fine. That one doesn't specifically say trap the same manner as a traffic violation. Okay. Okay. So the flight, but your question is about over 21 and the flight. Right, over 21 or generally, do you, so right now the language, we, I know I, we keep popping back and forth between section 1005 and section 1013, um, but section 1013, the language that we had struck through uh, was that a person not only shall not possess, but shall not purchase or attempt to purchase flavored products, flavored tobacco products. That's over 21. That's anyone. I better go back down to 113. But if they're legal to sell. Right, if they're legal to sell, they should not be getting purchased. Okay. Um, so maybe Unless it's the guy with the overcoat with the. Maybe it's simplest to just uh, take, continue to take that language out in section 1013 and then take out possession in. Yes. Five. Yes. Okay. All right. And so that would just leave C on page 17. Right. On page 17, right. That's the new C that we put in that says anyone who yeah. sells it or distributes it or um, otherwise, yes, anyone who sells, offers for sale, gives, provides, transports, manufactures or other manufacturers or otherwise distributes these products in this state um, is subject to a civil penalty uh, of up to $100 for first offense and up to $500 for subsequent offense, also brought in the same manner as a traffic violation. So that's the current penalty that we have for uh, sales to someone under age. Okay. Yes, but it's the penalty for someone over 21 also. This would be a penalty for selling Sell. these products or distributing these products regardless of the age of the purchaser. And I'll just say that the only place that I have trouble is um, we have tons of people from around here that go over to uh, particularly Akwesasne and the, right. and the casino and they bring stuff back to their friends. Yep. And I have a problem with um, um, putting somebody like that in a position where um, um, they're breaking the law. Well, uh, so Jed, uh, suppose... And I have no problem <coughs> with no. any of the vaping product products um, being, um, um, if they come back and bring vaping products, I'm not, it, it not really is about somebody that's older with, with a cigarette. Okay, so, um, and I know that the state police has always had fun, you know, inspecting cars, coming mm -hmm. back with tons of cigarettes and stuff, to avoiding the tax. Um, Jen, yes. if, so if um, I give Senator Westman Fifty dollars when he goes up to Aquasasni, and he comes back with some cartons of cigarettes, maybe two. Yep. <laughs> uh, it's any amount. For, for, with for me, uh, and I say, you know, just get me something. I don't say I don't specify, but he brings it back and he gives them to me as a gift. Well, if it's flavored, then it would ban. It would violate the ban on mm -hmm. giving or. Selling or otherwise so distributing uh -huh. flavored tobacco products. But somebody would have to find out that he actually did it, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah so he'd be breaking the law. We'd be breaking the law together. Yep. Okay. 
But that, that, is, that is currently what happens with uh, contraband tobacco products mm -hmm. uh, at, at a lower cost. And it's, right. I mean, yeah. any you know, under our existing law, in order to, and I'm just going up um, to the sale part, but I mean, you have to have a license to sell. Yeah. Um, he didn't sell. He bought for. Generally. A gift. Yeah, they go over on the bus gift? all the time. Oh, we get the senior center. Uh, yep, the senior center. All right, we'll mull that one. We'll, we're going to mull that, that one, that language. You think about it. Um, it does talk about, the existing law does talk about retail sale. Oh, it does. So it's a retail sale. It's in the retail okay. sale. So you're coming home with a car load. Yeah, that's different. So that, it's different. That, that's different yeah. than going over on the bus and, yeah. and having one of right. your friends at the senior center. Right. Pick, bring yeah. it back in your backpack. on your way. Okay. Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. and then I'm just checking. Nobody can engage in the retail sale. A person who sells these products without obtaining a tobacco license. I mean, this one doesn't specify retail sale, but the rest of the section is about retail sale. And to me, it's different between the menthol cigarettes and the, the vaping products. Well, they've been banned. Yeah, Everything. Yeah, yeah, right. right. They're banned. Okay, so it sounds like we're comfortable with a language that is in that 1.3, mm -hmm. um, that section on page 17, and the, and the previous section crossed out on page 16. Good. Right, so I think the question for you is for people over 21, is there any sort of um, exemption language or exception language you want for people who are doing work, you know, to, to address the issue that Senator Weston is bringing up? Well, is it, but in current statute, there's no exception language for that? There's not, but if you're not engaged in the retail sale, it's not clear that you have violated by giving something to someone. I mean, unless the person you're giving it to is underage. So we should just, I think we should go with what is current statute on that. I mean, be consistent, I think. Um, uh, doesn't, isn't that what page 17 does? It doesn't keep it consistent. Well, page 17, let me get back there. Um, page 17. No, I'm not confused on that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, when you say page 17, are you talking about that's that? the retail sales? I'm sorry? That's the retail sales penalty. Well, it's not a retail sales penalty. It's a penalty for any person who gives. sells, offers for sale, gives, provides, transports, manufactures, or otherwise distributes. Mm -hmm. And that's otherwise consistent with. What? That's not the same as the retail, just the retail sale. But is that consistent with current statutory language on tobacco only? Uh, so under current law on tobacco, oh. it says no person shall engage in the retail sale of tobacco products, tobacco substitutes, or tobacco paraphernalia in his or her place of business without a tobacco license. No person shall no person shall engage so, in the retail sale of tobacco. So why would you take out the gift or provide? Why don't we just go with that language for everything else? Uh, because I think that um, economic development can also struggle with this. And and that gets rid of the give or provide. Yeah, that gets rid of the give or provide, and it goes along with retail sales, which is what we're really trying to limit. Is get rid of sales. Yeah. Yeah. Let's so you would limit, you would change it from a person shall not do all of those things on page 16 to a person shall not engage in the retail sale of? Um, where are you? Yeah, on well, page 18, 16, line 16. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think we're trying to stick with what is current statute. Okay. And, and because I think it makes a lot more sense this this could become overly prescriptive and difficult to enforce. Okay. 
and we may find that it's another we have another iteration of something down the line and maybe economic development will look at that a lot a lesson specifically for that I think it solves some concerns that people have okay okay so that is so we're taking out possession from the under 21 we are changing the language for what is prohibited to be the retail sale um, and continuing to take out the language on possession and purchase on um, page 15. all right um where else were we then they have one more oh um the uh the advocates also wanted to make it clear that um that the penalties are assessed on the retailer and not the individual clerk so they would want to not the 16 year old kid yeah the cash that's the point right that's the point um so they would wanted to add a definition of tobacco retailer and then impose the penalty on tobacco on the tobacco retailer yes okay the retailer lose their license i'm sorry that's you does the retailer lose their license if they're caught selling uh, they drink? can if there are multiple violations they, they can. can okay for a certain period of time mm -hmm. um, okay and then so that's all of the advocate piece and then the the concern or the issue from the um cannabis folks has to do with uh with just the dispensary, um, but again, I'm, I'm not entirely, I, I understand why they would have concerns, but I'm not entirely clear which part they have concerns with, and they are suggesting um, so, adding language to the definition of a tobacco substitute having to do with substances sold by a dispensary to register patients and registered caregivers not being tobacco substitutes. No. Um, and I, I'm not sure oh, I got that, it. that that makes sense. I think that, so I went back and looked last year in um, a similar issue had come up in economic development and I had drafted language that didn't end up going in the bill, um, but that could add language in the no person uh, shall engage in a retail sale, it would say, notwithstanding that, a dispensary may engage in the retail sale of tobacco substitutes and tobacco paraphernalia to registered patients and registered caregivers. We could do the same thing on the flavored e liquid, e liquid or flavored e liquids. I guess my concern is uh, that if you start carving things out at the definition level, then something can be purchased at a dispensary, but used for whatever. Yeah, I think that's my concern. We exempted them at their request from the tax, the tobacco tax that we put on vapes last year, right. because people, that's how people consume their medical marijuana. I'm not sure I'm prepared to go to say you can have strawberry shortcake <laughs> medical marijuana. I don't know. That, uh, yeah, I know that Virginia Renfrew was here to talk about that briefly, uh, and and we'll let you do that. But the, the the concern I have is this opens up a whole new conversation, and also knowing that the House is just passing, or in the process of looking at cannabis generally yes and that this is really part of the dispensary conversation mm -hmm. um, right I mean I, you know I thought I think their concern may be in part that that there not be conflict between what you pass in this bill and what gets passed in S54 yeah so I, I, you know and it will it doesn't matter I mean whichever bill passes last that's the one that's going to stand uh, well, so, have we defined cannabis as a tobacco no, product? We don't have anything yet on that. Okay. We so what we're doing here shouldn't 
touch cannabis. That's another, they're not going to be taxed like tobacco products, I don't think. Right, I think the issue is more. when you have, um, when, when they're banned on use of um, tobacco substitutes or, or where you can purchase them, um, they get concerned about the accessibility for the patient. Yeah, it is a medication and it is it's by... It's a medication. It is by... So, so I can... Um, it is not a tobacco substitute. Well, our definition of tobacco substitute is really aimed at the device. And so the device, I, it's my understanding, is used, it is, I think, uh, sold at and used by patients to right. bake um, yeah. marijuana. Right. So, and, uh, Jen. Yes. Hold your hold on a sec. Um, Virginia Redfrew is here, and she's going to she's going to testify for just a couple of minutes, okay. and then we'll go back to our discussion around the table. Okay. Or designed to develop nicotine or other substances into the body through the, and then if you skip down, it says products that have been approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration or other medical purposes shall not be considered to be tobacco substitutes. So the U.S. food has not obviously approved of medical because the federal government doesn't recognize it. So that's the, and I know that in S54, um, I believe Jen might know this better, but there's language in there which bans flavored um, uh, THC vape pens already. Um, so our just we there are a number of patients who have no longer are actually smoking the flower. They prefer using the um, the vape pens, mm -hmm. um, which are uh, made at the dispensaries, and the Department of Health has already. Been and so, the, so. There, and there are there are separate prescription process through the Department of Health. No, they're or not through nothing. No, but safety. I mean, when the whole vape scare came, yeah. the Department of Health reached out to the dispensaries to ask them where they were getting their cartridges and the oil that was being put in to make sure that they didn't have vitamin E, and so they gave them all of that information. So, um, so I mean, that's just I know that my business partner Gail Zetz has been in contact with Jen, and we're just a little concerned over this other substance. So that, I mean, it's existing law. Um, so my concern about taking things out of the definition stage, as I said, is that it has an impact on a lot of other statutes. So we have bans on uses, the use of a tobacco substitute on school grounds. If you start saying, but it's not a tobacco substitute if it has um, THC in it, so, I mean, Jen, what we, the amendment that we sent to Senator Lyons, uh, Gail sent last night, and uh, I'm not sure if the committee got that or not, but we just had the line, other substances shall not include substances sold by a dispensary registered under 18 VSEA Chapter 86 for registered patients and registered caregivers, as those, I, uh, those terms are defined in 18 VSEA. Right, but I think that it doesn't, if you're taking it out of, if you're taking things sold by dispensaries out of the definition of tobacco substitute at the definitional level, yes. then you have else. a kid who has it who yes. shouldn't have it, yeah. So if, if there's a particular concern that you have, like which retailers can sell, or it's, I mean, with that garbage site of possession is not going to be banned. So I guess I'm not so it is what the purpose remains for having some sort of carve out. What is the problem that you are concerned will happen? I mean, I think the concern is, is that, you know, someone read this and then turns around and says to the dispensaries, we don't feel that you should be selling under this uh, new law that just passed that you should be selling uh, vape pens. Do you sell the the little pens, or is this more the big tanks? No, they're little. They're, they're, they're little, just they're, they're very, yeah. they're they're very slight. They're and battery. They char patients can charge them, so they buy it once. So usually. it's closer to Juul. It's not the big 
Yes, thing. yes, it's like a yes. It has a little cartridge. So that's what, when that runs out, then the patient just has to get a new cartridge. Um, and so, I mean, I just, I, I wanted to raise this issue. I know that there's been discussion in the committee that the legislative intent is that it does not include the THC, um, but I just wanted to raise it. So, um, so I mean, one thing we could do, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if it makes more sense either in the definition of the e-liquid, which is a solution substance or other material used in or with a tobacco substitute that is heated or otherwise acted upon to produce an aerosol vapor or emission to be inhaled by the user regardless of whether the liquid contains nicotine. Um, you know, it, it could, there could potentially be a better carve out <coughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to understand, other than potentially somebody misunderstanding the law and, and misinterpreting it, or I just don't understand what the problem is. I don't think this is a good solution, so what is the problem so we can address it in a different way? Okay, uh, so we get it. Yep. So, uh, like so we're going to gonna have to digest this again, and then and we'll just talk about it a little bit before we have to go up on the floor. Um, I, I'm inclined. I'm inclined to think that because we we have a fairly robust medical dispensary uh, statute, uh, that it's that that's where this question should be resolved. I, I do. I think. Uh, some notwithstanding language in that section. Oh. Huh? They work. We could potentially put something um. in, in title, in, the, in that chapter in title 18. Yes, we could. Mm -hmm. And, you know. And we do have, we do have a bill, we have a bill in, S, uh, in the House Human Services S-117. So maybe that's when we, I'm um, thinking that it might best be resolved, and, and maybe that bill or, or the other cannabis yes. bill, and so just some notwithstanding language. So we don't have to get into it in this bill, but at least we were cognizant of it when questions come, come up. Does that work? I think that should work. Okay, yes. we'll, and we can support that okay. process. Okay, good. Thank you. Virginia, I'm happy to help think that through. Okay, All right. thank you very Terrific. Much. <sighs> Oops, sorry. Well done. <laughs> okay. We knew it was there. We knew it was there. It, it is a, It is difficult. This is tough stuff. All right. So now we have Jen. Yep. Can we look at a clean draft, weather permitting? Uh, we're going to come back to this sometime next week, uh, and then we can and then we can uh, have our clean draft. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to get this bill out. Oh. So when you say clean draft, I can certainly take out all of the things we have decided to, you know, clean up from what we did today. Do you want to see the additional changes from today in, you know, bold and highlight and stuff so you can Yeah, see? we should see that. We should okay. see that. I so I will bring you a version that incorporates everything that is currently highlighted um, the way it is described and then makes the additional changes that we talked about. Excellent. Okay. Thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you for accommodating. Oh, no problem. I hope you're in a comfortable chair by the fireplace. Oh, it's good, yeah. Okay. <laughs> We're with you. <laughs> That's where we want to be. Yes. Um, so, uh, okay, thank you. And Senator Ingram and I might be in touch with you about putting together some kind of a chart or something that's more explanatory on some of the nuance within the bill and with the FDA. So we can talk about that. Okay. All right. We're going to, Senator Cummings, are you good at hanging up? Am I hanging the red, I the red, the little red, red bye. Oh, got it. <laughs> oh, good grief. Yes, you all. That, that was good. I mean, yeah. that was actually good. It wasn't bad having her. Um, I, I do like having her here, but we actually accomplished something. Yeah. How about that? So, mm -hmm. enjoy your weekend.